What is up, football fans? This is Danny Austin. This is the Live from the 55 podcast. I don't know that I love the way I did what is up, football fans. That's not normally how I do it, but we're coming at you, guys. Here we are in our Marta Loop Studios, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It is Sunday night. We are about, what, I'd say 20 minutes, half an hour removed from the Montreal Alouettes, beating the Calgary Stampeders 25-18. Stamps are now dropped two and five. They have four incredibly tough games. I got Ian Busby coming in. We had a lot to talk about. Um, I do not think it is inconceivable that the Stamps are two and nine going into the Labor Day Classic. I don't think it's inconceivable that the Edmonton Elks will not have won a game. In fact, I think that's likely. Uh, wow, the big game of the year, the the All Alberta Tilt. It would be a two and nine team against an zero oh and whatever team. We'd hate to see that. I hope that's not how this plays out. But this is part of why we said, we've been saying for weeks, that we thought that last weekend against the Ottawa Red Blacks was such a huge game uh, for these Calgary Stampeders. They needed to get to 500. They needed to get to 3-3 three and three at the time. Instead, they lost in overtime. And then, ultimately tonight, they had a chance to tie it. They had a chance to send it to overtime. They were down there. They were what? Let's take a look at this. They were quite literally on... The Montreal 10-yard line. They just needed to you know, get a first down, get three yards, and they couldn't. They went for the end zone. Uh, Jake Mayer did not connect with Luther Hakanavanu. Montreal, no, twice. That's all she wrote. 25-18. Um, just, I got to tell you, I watched this game with Ian Busby, with, uh, with my friend and yours, John Bender, Watch with a couple, you know, former Stamps alumni. Um, Watch with a lot of, with with a great little crowd. People were really excited. And it was an exciting game. And this has been the thing. I know fans are frustrated. But what? Stamps have been in every single game. There is an argument that look how close they are every single game. But there's the counter argument. And I understand the frustration settling, setting in right now. I hear it from everywhere. Believe me, my Twitter is a nightmare. I'm not looking forward. There are a bunch of people who just email me. Um, appreciate them. Guys, keep hitting me up. I, I mean, I can't do anything. Can't make any changes. But um, there is frustration with this team. I will say, my main takeaways from this game, I thought that the defense was borderline excellent. Um, look, the Alouettes only scored one touchdown. It was a pick six. It was a Jake Mayer interception that they ran back into the edge zone, got the seven points. That ended up being the difference in this game otherwise what did both teams kick six field goals yeah um you know you're you can't put this on the defense there were some big plays that i didn't love i will say there was a huge um defensive pass interference call on jonathan moxie in my mind the receiver's not catching that ball i don't know why that is always called in this league it's like any contact on the receiver and we just automatically say it's dpi i hate it um I think it's honestly, it's lazy refereeing and lazy officiating, but whatever. That's not what made the difference. That's not the difference maker in this game, nor was the rough in the passer penalty on Mike Rose late in the fourth quarter. I did not like that call. If I'd be honest with you, I thought that there was a makeup call late in the fourth. The Stamps got a second shot at, at ultimately tying this up. Uh, I didn't like that. Didn't particularly like that call. I just don't know. You're defensive lineman. You're trying to bust through your O lineman and you hit the quarterback after the play. I don't think those are automatically, for me, rough in the passer. Uh, I know we're trying to protect our quarterbacks and the quarterbacks around the league have been going down and getting hurt. Cody Fajardo certainly looked like he was playing, uh, playing as damaged goods for much of the game today. But look, those penalties, although I will say, sorry, allow me to interrupt myself. Those penalties, you look at it and what? The Stamps had seven for 98. The Alouettes had five for 60 yards. I I, I do think that there were a couple big moments where the Stamps took penalties they just couldn't take, and it it really hurt them. Um, You know, there were weird penalties. There was, what, an illegal participation call on Trey Odom Stukes, which I honestly, this is why I like being in the stadium. This is why I like covering games live. I don't really understand what happened on that play, Um, but I'm not saying it was a bad call. It probably was the right call. I'm sure it was the right call. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying that penalties hurt the Samson. And then ultimately, luck. I, I can't. What am I going to say? Um, I like Jake Mayer. I have advocated again and again, and I will continue to advocate that with young quarterbacks, you know, there's a learning curve in this league. 
you have to be patient. You look around the CFL. I think it's typically not 25, 26 year old quarterbacks who are who are dominating. It hasn't been this year. Brennan Adams in his 30s. This is the point that Jeff uh, Hamilton made very early in our little run here at Live from the 55. You look at Zach Caleros. You look at Trevor Harris. You know these guys often can play into their late 30s, but they're not they're not finished products. And I feel bad for Jake. And no one wants me to feel bad for Jake. No one wants to hear, oh hey, give you know treat Jake like a human. You look at the stat line, 24 or 44. He did 24 or 44 passes for 256 yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions. It's not It's not great. I'm not going to sit here and say it's great. Um, it ultimately, that pick six is the difference between you know winning and, I guess, tying. Um, we're going to overtime in this game. I understand people late in the game questioning some of, some of where the ball went particularly on that final drive after Tommy Lee Lewis had an amazing return to give them a chance. I get it. I understand it with why people are frustrated with Jake. I will continue to say, guys, who else? Who else are you going to go get? The Lions aren't trading to Dave and Dane Evans. Get used to it. This is Jake. We are have to watch him grow and progress, hopefully. And to be honest, I think that we've seen lots from Jake over his CFL career that suggests he is absolutely capable of doing it. I consider myself to be a fan of Jake Mayer, I consider myself to be um, a believer of Jake Mayer. It's not happening the way you want it to right now. Uh, these turnovers, look, it's the turnovers. It's the interceptions. And we saw it with Bo last year. Um, they're just too many. And they're, and I, I don't know what has to happen uh, for them to stop. I don't know if that's fully on Jake. I don't know if that's on the play calling. I don't know. You know, there are some busted routes out there. Um, it's not working. And... Right now, the stamps are two and five. Now, are we like games? The games aren't played on paper. Um, Toronto, let's, I'm just going to pull up the stamp schedule. Um, I know what it is for the most part. I believe it is Toronto, BC, Winnipeg, Toronto. Um, but I want to make sure I don't get any of those wrong. Um, Toronto, Calgary, next Friday. That's a huge game, obviously, against an undefeated opponent, the Grey Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts. <laughs> Their head coach is your former quarterback coach. They're defensive coordinator is your former defensive line coach they've got a receivers coach and pete costanza former guest friend of the pod um who's obviously here josh bell like you go up and down the roster there's so many former stamps there you know that they're coming into calgary with a chip on their shoulder wanting to prove wanting to prove something that's a that's a huge game for the argos it's a huge game for the stamps um are you picking the stamps to win i i, I doubt it um well, i guess there are questions about chad kelly i don't really think there are questions about chad kelly um, but after that, you're going to BC, a BC team that shot out. God, that was depressing. The Edmonton Elks, second time this season, 27 nothing. Uh, the Lions are cruising, man. That defense is really good. Um, and for a Stamps offense that right now has questions, that is going to be a challenge. I, I will be honest with you. I didn't, everyone says, oh, Jake's bad under pressure. Jake's bad under pressure. I don't say that. Um, Jake was under too much pressure um, this week. I, I honestly thought that. Guys were getting on him awful quick, way more than I would have liked. So that is a very good BC Lions defensive line. I, I think that they're going to cause trouble. That's, that's a tough game in Vancouver on August 12th. Then it's Winnipeg at at Calgary. Winnipeg has absolutely basically dominated this like quote unquote rivalry um, since 2019 with the Stamps. This is you know that's it may be at Calgary. The Bombers may be old. Um, I shouldn't say old. But they might be getting on in years. They might not quite be the same sprightly team as we saw, but that's a tough game. And then if you're the Stampeders, you are going then to Toronto, August 25th. Um, yeah, what, what more can you say? That is just, that's the, that's the toughest stretch I could give you other than all those games being on the road, I guess. Um, but that is as hard a stretch of games that the CFL could hand up, hand out to the Calgary Stampeders. And the reality is, I mean, I think that, the Ottawa Red Blocks and Montreal Alouettes are lesser teams than any of those, and they gave the Stamps all that they could handle. This is, it's weird. You, you just look, and it's like, well, the 24-11 loss to Winnipeg, the 25-15 loss, but other than that, I mean, the Stamps beat the Red Blacks in week two, lost by a field goal to the Riders in week three. Week six, they win by two. Week seven, they lose in overtime. You hate to lose by a touchdown. I mean, they're they're in the games. They're uh, uh, everyone saying, "Oh, give up hope." Well, these are not the Edmonton Elks. Boy, is that 
a difficult situation. Uh, we are obviously going to. I've got Ian coming in here. We are going to talk a lot of stamps. Um, but this is, we do attempt to make this a little bit of a, you know, roundup episode. Uh, we're not going to go on for, I'm not going to go on solo for a whole lot longer because why would I? It's more fun when I've got someone to chat with. Um, yeah, Ian was working today. Met him at a pub. I think he had a beer. I drank more water. I hiked today. I hiked up a, hiked up a mountain. Trying to get back in shape, guys. Trying to look good for the live from the 55 audience. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Looking around, you got Hamilton beating Ottawa 16-12. Of course, Billy Mitchell gets injured on the final drive. We're going to talk about that. I tend to just not think that that was nearly as big a deal. Uh, then you got the Toronto Argonauts, you know, just, just, I don't even say massacring, massacring, because that's not really true, but, you know, laying a beating on the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, 31-13. Um, the Argos are the best team in the league, the Rough Riders. Yeah, they got to, they got to figure some things out. Quarterback, question for a lot of teams around the league. Um, arguably seven of the nine. Uh and then, honestly, you had Saturday night, BC Lions 27, Edmonton Elks 0. Um, game made me really sad and depressed. You know, I don't, I, I didn't grow up at the Calgary Edmonton rivalry, so it might just not mean quite as much to me as it does to other people. But um, this is not easy, seeing what's happening to Edmonton. That's an important market for the CFL. Uh, that's a great sports market. It just, it, 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 something has to change. And I know everyone's like, oh, there's a coaching cap. I'm not going to call for <laughs> Chris Jones to be fired or anything like that. But honestly, if if it's the coaching cap that's preventing it from happening, Randy has my permission. Get rid of the coaching cap for one team and not the other eight. Just do it. I don't know. We got to fix this. Get it fixed. It's not fair, but life's not fair. Things are hard. Ian Busby has just walked in. We're going to get set up here. and We're going to go. All right, guys. Before we get going, I got Ian Busby here, but it's important that I really quickly talk about my favorite charcuterie spot. You know, it's not even close. It's number one by with a, with a bullet. Um, delicious elevated cheese, charcuterie made with fresh artisanal provisions, fun demand grazing. What more can you ask for? Um, I love Fraser and Fig. Honestly, like I really do. I've said this many times. Uh, we were with John Bender today. I will say that I was hiking with... Uh, my dear friend Kami Kepke today, and she said that there's no way that we are eating charcuterie on air without her. So I believe... Oh, really? So now it's become a buffet of uh, well, Calgary media. People. I can't think of anywhere I'd rather get a buffet than Fraser and Fig. Ready to go cheese and charcuterie boxes curated with local and artisanal ingredients. They got four sizes. We're going to get the big one. They suit every occasion. Let me finish. Um, all boxes come with meat, cheese, dry fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, carrots. Their selections vary month to month the choices you know you can you can do all sorts of different things year round switch every month try 12 a year try more than 12 year do whatever you want the point is i love fraser and fig they're a great sponsor i super appreciate them and i'm very happy to have them and we are going to um have cami kept on for those watching on youtube but i've one of the things i figured out is that whoever is further back our heads look more normal size. So, like, if I move up, I look like I have an enormous head. Um, <laughs> this is great radio, by the way. Yeah. For those people listening on podcasts. Anyways. Yeah. Ian. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll try to be at the same level then. Yeah. Uh, here's the thing. If you wait until to do this big charcuterie board feast and everything, you're going to have everybody, like, by the end of the season, everybody's going to want to be on board. And it's just going to be, like, a, walking around this giant party. It's going to be, like, a wedding party. Like if, if that many people, like this is going to be massive. If I if I went to a wedding party and it was Fraser and Frank was there, yeah, it'd be great. I'd be thrilled. I'm saying this is this is, sounds like a great idea, but how how much do you want to let this build all the way to the end of the season? And then it's just going to be like the biggest <laughs> biggest bash <laughs> for me. for like like literally. I intend on doing it every time that I say I'm doing it next episode. I actually mean it. It's it's just it's been a wild time. Um, Ian Busby. Yes. I said this in the intro. It is impossible right now. I am just, I have to respond on some level to what the fans are talking about. That is part okay. of the job. Um, I haven't looked yet. Uh, yes. I know what we were talking about while watching this game. So uh, it's uh, Jake Mayer, 24 of 44, 256 yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions. I think there is more going on with this team than Jake Mayer's performance. Jake Mayer himself said after the game against Ottawa, there are too many turnovers, too many interceptions. And turnovers um, was the exact 
thing that got him this one and not being able to punch the ball in the end zone. So that bagel in the touchdown column and the two in the interception column, that's the entire story right there. It was a pick six the other way. How many times are you going to win games when you're giving up pick sixes? You can't give up pick sixes. It's just, and especially early. And it was the whole difference of the entire game was they were always, Montreal Alouettes were always up a touchdown because of the pick six. Look at the defense. The, the Montreal Alouettes also had zero touchdowns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Six. The defense the defense played exceptionally well. I thought, um, you know, because the the Alouettes had a good attack against them. They kept moving the ball, but then they'd shut it down and force field goals. Six field goals for each team and a pick six. No offensive touchdowns. And uh, that, that I mean, it's the biggest part of this game. It's tough, and I don't think that this is how the coaches necessarily break down. Um, no, games absolutely. when they when they come and look at it, it's just it is so hard to not look at look at this game and say, oh, well, these teams are nearly identical. Yeah, uh, and the only difference was those was those interceptions. Now, I will also say, uh, I'm repeating myself a little bit from what we said in the intro. I do think that seven penalties for 98 yards versus five for 60, and I yeah. think that there were a number of those penalties when the stamps got into. Um, enemy territory yes and it kind of took them out and it felt like every penalty was, killed drives was a key penalty like yeah they extended drives on montreal with or were very questionable roughing the passer call on mike rose late in the game and then that was given back though that's my issue it was like yeah it was I, given back on the next drive but it was again it was just like it felt like a killer at the time and then when you get into the like inside the 10 and take two penalties to put yourself in a second and very long to get to the end zone that those were crushing penalties and just ones that, you know, a, a team a third of the way into the season, more than a third of the way into the season, you've got to start cleaning that stuff up and not allowing that to happen. So you can't, yeah. when, when you're having a hard time scoring, you can't put yourself in a worse position just by making a mistake. Well, like, and the, like substitution and that type of stuff. That's, that's not Calgary Stampeders way very often. No. Um, and I, I, that's why I'm, I'm bringing it up to say that this was not as simple as Jake Mayer threw no. two interceptions, uh, one of which was a pick six, and it lost them. The game. It, it is not as simple as that. Are Do you, you have watched, I, to be honest, what's wild is I've, I've covered the Stampeders for, for seven years, uh, mm -hmm. started in 2016. Now, last year was sort of the start of the quarterback transition. So I, I did cover that. Uh, you, in your time covering the Stampeders, covered several, I do believe, right? I mean, yeah. you you went for, well, you can I mean, go they, through it, but. Like, the only real transition that I was covering was well, from Burris to Drew Tate, because when it was just a, a mess before that, and, you know, they, they had the Dickinson era, 2000. 2000 he was coming back in 2003 he went to bc and didn't come back to calgary they had a flux of quarterbacks so this is the like this kind of the second big one that i've you know third i guess because then it was like over to kevin glenn and drew tate i consider that to be one little era and then from drew tate over to to completely to bo levi mitchell so then it was like okay so those transitions this one is obviously gonna have some growing pains and the last one did but what happened was Drew Tate came in and uh, was hurt a lot, and Kevin Glenn was the guy taking over. So it was not a, like a like a quick transition to a new player. And then the other one was Drew, Bo Levi Mitchell coming in, and we knew we've said this before on this podcast that that was just a, a meteoric rise. Like nobody else has had that type of start of career that Bo, Bo had, and nobody should be well, held to that standard. But you're seeing like ups and downs, and you expect this with the young young quarterback ups and downs. Um, just a couple of bad mistakes today, and I I just. But it's my pertinent question because when you talk about Drew Tate, Drew Tate that was not a a, a straight line when Drew no. Tate sort of took over from Henry Burris. It did not always go smoothly. Um, I mean, the team it was never very, actually went anywhere. It never actually went anywhere. But there was a there, there is an important distinction there that you brought up, which is that they had a veteran established CFL quarterback in Kevin Glenn waiting in the wings. Yes. Um, I People can email me, tweet me, say whatever they want. Um, Stamps don't have another option. No. Like, I, no, it, it's, it's I, I mean, you can say, oh, I, I loved what Tommy Stevens did. 31-yard 
um, yeah, that was run today. Play. That yeah. was a great play. Uh, obviously, when he was called on, he he got the yards he needed. But like we we haven't seen any indication that he can actually throw the ball. Throw the ball. Yeah. Um, and then you have, you know, a, a couple of guys who are what two months into their into their CFL careers who none of us know know a yeah. damn thing about. Dave Dickinson, I asked him. Um, I'm not saying that to be like, oh, you asked him, but I, but I did ask him yeah. uh, at the end of last season. I said, hey, look, we all know Bo's leaving. Is it a priority to have a a veteran proven CFL backup? Right. And he said, of course. Now, the problem is there We're aren't. Where are you going to get those guys? Well, right? yeah. those guys are starters now, yeah. right? I mean, Nathan Rourke left, so Brian Adams Jr. is a starter. Yeah. NBC, they got Dane Evans. They're the only ones who actually managed to do it. Well, and the thing is, because they have been paying guys so much less, they could actually go out and I think they made the best offer for Dane Evans. I think that was what it came down to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they also had to trade for him, which is what they did. So, but I, I, it's a difference there, right? It's yes. Now I think that there would be nothing better for Jake Mayer's development than to have a a a veteran, a a Kevin Glenn help, like working in the room, doing all that. I, I am still a believer that Jake Mayer is, is ultimately the quarterback of the future of the Calgary Stampede. Um, I genuinely believe that, and I think he is going through some growing pains and a tough stretch, and I just don't think that we are used to young quarterbacks anymore and having to give them time. Um, Typically, like your average young quarterback, like you look at Dane Evans when he came in. Yeah, Dane Evans came in because he was forced in. So there was a little bit of, well, you're not the starter, so even when you make mistakes, we're going to – you're not – It's easier to – You're filling in for Mazzoli. Exactly. Well, I'm talking like Dane Evans when he broke in uh, initially. Yes. Um, It was like, well, you're not Mazzoli, so mistakes are understandable. You're the backup. You're just being forced into playing. Typically, I I, I don't think that we've seen a lot of young quarterbacks in in recent years succeed while thrown into the starting starting position. Now – Chad like, Kelly, like, everyone yells at me that Chad Kelly's not young, even yeah. though, like, guys, I'm using it. Like, it's I'm using it because he's a first year starter. Like, I know he's not young. He's also an SEC quarterback. Um, like, I, I I just think that ultimately, like, we are seeing the growing pains that come with with, with a young quarterback. And yeah. I think Jake would be the first to admit that he's not playing his best and that he's not playing well enough for this team to win. But until honestly, there are people who just seem to delight right now. And just saying, Jake sucks, Jake sucks, Jake sucks. It's like, yeah, well, you're not offering a single okay. alternative so, or a solution. So this is what I was hearing back in 2005 when Henry Burris came in. And it was Henry Burris's kind of first real, you're the number one guy season. And he had been in the, like, in the late 90s with Calgary. He goes to Saskatchewan. He starts for one year. He throws, like, 25 interceptions. Everybody says, oh, yeah, he's got a lot of potential. Then he goes to the NFL for a couple of years, comes back to Saskatchewan. He doesn't get the... Neil, they picked Neil on green. They didn't give him the starting job. They picked Neil on green instead of him. They, he, he signs with Calgary as a uh, free agent and comes in. And then, then all year, all through to 2005, it was, uh, are we sure that Henry verse has it? Are we sure that he's going to be the guy of the future? It was like, well, we don't know, but we, everything is, it just feels like it's there. There's little things that show you that you have to have confidence. You have to have patience and look what, how that turned out right mm-hmm. so but again when a lot of these times it's like when dane evans came in a couple of years ago that team was solid top to bottom that was a 15 win team not by accident the stamps are not solid top to bottom right they now. are not solid top to bottom and i think we can find all the flaws within this team and you it's evident when you're watching them play there's just little things missing and it's not all the quarterback it's of course it's not all the quarterback. And I will say that to be honest, I like I felt like Jake was under more pressure than he would have liked. Oh, today. Was, I thought there was, there was a lot of pressure tonight. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that I, I think that one of the criticisms of Jake is that people don't love the way he handles the pressure, and that is fine. But like honestly, guys, your average CFL quarterback, we're not gonna love the way they handle pressure. Yeah. Um, like I love the way Patrick Mahomes handles pressure. Yeah, That's well. it. That's I love the way to be fair, I love the way Zach Kolaris handles pressure yeah. um in general. But I will say, so I'm I want to just quickly like stick with the offense. I will say, um man, Reggie Bagels in hell of a game. Yes, um, some absolutely incredible catches. I when, do when they needed a big play, he was there for it, and it was a couple of times. I looked at you and I was like, yeah, Bagel, they go to Bagleton on second and I'm down and you just needed the first down. Almost every time. I thought yeah. Trey Adams Dukes was also, I mean, so like I'm just, that. I'm basically just looking to see who's that. Yeah, they um, both had eight catches each. Yeah. Like, that's, that's a lot of catches for uh, your inside guys, right? So, yes. Um, the way they use the, 
the run was a little strange, but it wasn't really working. So I think they got away yeah. from it. And then you said it. I mean, there was a play, like it was very late, and clearly the play was breaking apart. So Jake just kind of threw it off to yeah. to Mills, and it looked. I thought they were going to lose yardage on that yeah. play, and, and he just broke tackles to make exactly. Um, and but here's the thing, like, and we were saying this during the game. Like, Jake can see and he's got some open yardage, and he, he's indecisive, and then he just like he kind of pumps, and then he like dumps it off right. And the receiver's like, I'm covered, like run. And everyone in this building is expecting him to run because he's got yardage to get a few yards, just push the ball downfield. Yep. And there's something in that. He's just got that one step of indecisiveness where he, he could roll out pump fake the defense is kind of, okay, are you running or not? I'm like that's when he's got to go and he's not doing that. And it's, it's a part of this. I think he wants to get his, receivers the ball let them make the plays but he's got to just take the first down and reset yeah. and go again and it, it was frustrating to see him a couple of times it happened i, I would say three times tonight where it was just no like, you pointed oh, out to me when we pull, were watching pull it, it down and run like just go and and, all, and then on the next drive Fajardo would do that and you were like this is the difference between the, you know a guy who's got a few more years on him i will say that i'll completely opposite a little bit i guess alternative on that last drive, and I, I don't come in here and question play calling because coaches are smart. Every football coach is smarter about football than me. Yeah. So I, I honestly, like, you'll never hear me do it. They did, after Tommy Lee Lewis got them that return to get them yeah. into the range. That felt like the the play that was going to get them to tie and send this. And it just felt like you had, you still had about 40 seconds on the clock, and they just, they went deep. Yeah. Like, and at it, least two times in a row, yeah. possibly three. And was, they, they went deep a lot, and it was... It was like there's lots of time on the clock. I know. I don't know why they went didn't go underneath. Yeah. I, like no, I don't. I don't know what the what the look that the defense was giving was. And, and I genuinely don't know. Actually, legit saw guys open and yeah. I just it was just didn't connect, but it it felt like you guys don't need to get like there's 40 seconds in the CFL is a long period of time. When we you, were with when you got 35 <laughs> yards. You're just like slow down, like slow it down. You don't need to worry. Like we were with a former. CFL, who we're not going to name, not John Bender. That's not who I'm saying. John Bender, we were also with, yeah. who like was very adamant that there was that there was passive defense in some of those plays, yes. and if the Stamps had still had their um, had their challenge, they they would have used it. However, had the Stamps still had their challenge, they likely would have used it on the Mike Rose yes. rough in the passer play earlier. Um, okay, I want to again because. I, I think it's important that we not just talk Stamps. It's very funny. I My plan for this was the Sunday show to be the, like, wrap-up wrap up of the whole week. The yeah. whole week. But we just and had then Stamps games on Sunday. We've just so had Stamps games on Sunday. It's really fresh in our minds. Um, ultimately, like what? We like Tommy Lee Lewis. I thought that the defense did great. Um, yeah. I, I will say this again. I just right. think that the officials need to do a better job of figuring out, was the ball catchable before you call defensive pass interference? I'm so sick of these calls. I'm not, they go against the stamps sometimes, they go for the stamps sometimes. If the receiver can't catch the ball, it shouldn't be DPI. It's yeah. it's outrageous. And I, I just hate it. This has been going on for years and years and years and years. Um, last thing I'm going to ask, actually, you know, it's not the last thing I'm gonna ask about the stamps. I am gonna quickly say I expect Kadeem Carey back next week. I don't know that Kadeem Carey makes a big enough difference over um Diedrich Mills that that's necessarily gonna, you know, transform Can the entire Diedrich season. Mills on the roster with Kadeem Carey back gonna be roster. very curious to see. Um it was just such a weird week. James Fodder is being added. I mean, like he's done for the season. I don't know why like, that's been told. I've been told that. Um, obviously, everything that happened with Jaguar Davis. Yeah, that was, a, <laughs> it was weird. Could have, could have the fact Jim that Jim we're Jim. not talking about that right now, we're just like sort of moving past it is crazy because that was a really big story. Yeah. It's all I basically wrote Again, about the, this week. The defense was not the issue tonight. So, uh, no. Yeah. Um, no. And it's just, I don't know. I look, they, they've got 13 guys. On the sixth game, although they haven't actually updated some of this because they still have, I don't know. Let's just move on. Um, late, right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> There's something strange going on online associated with the CFL. Oh uh, yeah, no, it's not point oh. I will say credit to them. The stats worked live. Um, last question on the stamps. The I said it on the online. Yeah. <laughs> Toronto at home, BC and Vancouver, Winnipeg at home. In Toronto, Toronto and Toronto, do they win one of those games? You have to say yes, right? Yes, yeah, they have to win some. They yeah. have to win one of those games. Like, okay, so 
well, the road games are tough going into BC, going into Toronto. You feel better about your games at home, although they haven't won at home yet. This the year. Stamps play well against Toronto at home. They that's do. they they always yeah. do. So that's and it's weirdly the one where I'm like, oh, I think that of the four, they might beat the best team in the league who haven't lost a single game and just yeah. absolutely stomp the Riders. But it's also just but, like history tells me that Toronto just lays an egg every time they have the cat. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing: Toronto's due for a bit of a, a letdown because. I, I watched that entire touchdown Atlanta game. Okay, let's uh, let's let's move on to that. Okay, good. And that that just felt like a team that was like the Toronto Argonauts feel like they're just going to roll out of bed and win, especially against a, game, a game team like Saskatchewan. And well, Saskatchewan, especially Mason Fine led Saskatchewan. Yeah, and the thing is, well, he he wasn't that bad, except another couple of big <laughs> big turnovers, and then they had a couple of big plays on uh, special teams. So the Argos get a couple of big, those big plays that really boost your team. When they when you start playing with a lead, they can start just ball managing and and keeping their uh, like Chad Kelly did really nothing in that game. And it and, sounds like he was a little bit hurt, but yeah. there was a thumb thing going on there. But yes, right. I agree. And again, it's like, but they just felt like they were just we're a better team, and we're going to show you we're a better team. We're going to have those turnovers when it when it's costly <laughs> the riders they get down right to the goal line they try to punch it in they put the ball in the turf like what that, did john bender say we had some non-football fans there yeah and bender was like if i tell you that the stamps didn't get a touchdown and turn the ball over twice yeah what do you say in advance like that's all i tell you oh my god they lose yeah and i i mean that's the same thing here right yeah, that's, that's like same, yeah. you look at the numbers and First downs, Sask 22, Toronto 13. Yeah. Net offense, 426 to 200. That's, I actually like hadn't broken it down like this. Like I watched the game. Um, and to be honest, I thought it was actually like, <laughs> in part, just because the Argos were just like, yeah. they, as you said, just never felt like they were under They never under felt threat. like they were in any jeopardy of losing, the, taking the lead. Like, yeah. Just, they just got out to an early lead. I mean, it's five turnovers to one turnover. Yeah. And then five sacks allowed to one. Well, and, I think yeah. I saw this like the other day. It was the turnover ratio among the lead, and they were plus thirteen. And everyone, the next best team was plus two. And it was like, well, which team's undefeated? Pretty, pretty yeah. clearly there, right? Yeah, that defense is that defense is playing at a very high level. Yeah. It's weirdly players that like I know, <laughs> like yeah, it's know. so strange just, being like, oh, remember when I told everyone Deshaun Amos was playing at an all-star level, yeah, and then he just no, stopped playing. No, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fuller well, he, and he was, he was excellent in that game. Um, and, of course, and when you have an early pick six, you tend to be able to control the rest of the game. Yep. So it's, it's just oh, the way it goes. Get the lead. Um, Hamilton, six, Hamilton 16, Ottawa 12. I will say, to be honest, like uh, the result of this one, I thought, is ultimately like... Secondary uh, to the whole Levi Mitchell story? Or? Yes. And so I will just say... And I am going to lead with my opinion on this. Um, I understand why, like, oh, yeah, don't have your quarterback in that situation. Don't do it. Don't whatever. It's also like I feel like that happens all the time and the player doesn't get hurt. So we yeah. don't talk about it. Yeah. Like Bo wanted to finish the game. He's been out for a while. Yeah. He went in. It's weird that they did that. Like, it's like it's I, I don't I don't, I don't fully. Know. It's, it's only a four point lead. You still want it. You're still closing it out. They Very could good. have knelt twice, though, right? And one they could have just knelt. But they were too close to the goal line. They giving up safety and then the ball back okay fair so they needed to move the ball just enough yeah. forward that they could you know keep the keep the running clock going basically yeah. it sucks and i mean the tie cats did release a statement saying that Bo will be back this season like it's yeah, a he's got a broken lower part of his leg it shouldn't be something that long term but man he's been through so much now like he's he's had now how many broken legs is this it's impossible to not imagine him retiring after this I, season I right can't, like I he, can't imagine that he wants to keep doing this no. like uh, i wouldn't want to keep doing this like and it's it's none of it's his fault it's just yeah it's just what happens it's i mean he also fault. what five interceptions yeah uh wasn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's the thing they have five interceptions and lose their starting quarterback and they win the game that's the thing that's their defense was excellent Every, too so. everything that we said about about both calgary <laughs> yeah. and saskatchewan i was like well there are exceptions to those rules so um, yes. but yeah obviously look i have a relationship with Bo. you know dates back many years um not as not as close as i am with some of the other guys but um Sucks to see, man. I was really yeah. hoping that he would kind of get a redemption year. Uh, uh, I'm not I saying was, it's done. I, was, I thought it was. It, I thought it was in the cards and the way that they were. Like they, they pick him up. They've hosted in the Grey Cup. It just felt like Hamilton going back. 
they lost the Grey Cup at home two years ago in overtime. It just felt like eh, the storyline. It is was, written. The storyline was too perfect for us, is what it was. Yeah. And it just didn't turn out that way. Finally, we're speeding through them, but I partially wanted to get to this game um, because <laughs> the BC uh, Lions beat the Edmonton Elks. 27 0. I actually am saying this seriously. And, like, okay, I am not calling for Chris Jones. I asked John Bender. I asked you. I am yeah. sincerely saying this. It would not be fair for the league to say when you when you fire coaches, yeah, they are their salaries are go against the coaching cap. Yeah. So it, it basically is discouraging that from happening. Yes. It basically has handcuffed the outs. So they have not won a game this season. They haven't won a home game. And I don't have the stats in front of me. It doesn't matter anymore. It's two. It's, it's a it's profession. 21, it's 21 yes. games. It's the longest. In the um, which is what I thought it was. I just didn't want to get it wrong. I was like, better yeah. just acknowledge that I don't have it. I've hiked a mountain. I've watched a football game. I've written a story. I'm I'm now recording a podcast. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> honestly, I am not calling for him to be fired. But like, if it if that rule that stupid coaching step yeah. cap is handcuff handy handcuffing them to the point where this absolute travesty of a season it's, in my it's, opinion and i i have more to say on this but this is drink. honestly just let them do it and not have it count against the cap no other team gets to do it edmonton does it but well, like we are literally so worried about that that edmonton you're the exception to the rule sorry i wouldn't mind that now if you don't want to fire chris jones i'm not saying fire him what I'm saying is that it was utterly inexcusable for him to keep rolling Taylor Cornelius out there, getting sacked. He looked like a defeated man. He looked like a broken quarterback. And, you know, I was on 770, and Jock Wilson played this clip of, of Chris Jones saying, we, we have to turn over every leaf. We have to figure out what's going on. I was like, well, you're not doing that, are no, you? No, your number one problem is your quarterback. And you have two other quarterbacks on the sideline there, and you chose not to play them. You chose to let this guy just go out and get absolutely you crucified. You, tr you traded up into the first round. Didn't they trade up for that pick? Or they used their first round selection. You on looked a, on good last year. And, he, and they haven't played him. They haven't put him on the field for anything. And it makes no sense. But so the, the coaching thing, the, the, the Elks came in handcuffed anyway because they had fired their previous coach. So he was hiring a bare bones staff. And so Chris Jones is doing three jobs because he can't hire more people because of this coaching. You don't thing. have to change the rule. Just no. ignore the rule. Yeah. Just and not, yeah. it may not be Chris Jones. It may literally be saying, Hey, if there's any old money yeah. that's being left, Just, it's, like, it's off. You can hire, hire better people. Yeah. Cut uh, off the, the money they still owe to uh, their last yeah. coach. And Just fix it. Media. Jamie Elizondo, that's what his name is. And I get that, like, a bunch of other teams might be kind of mad about that. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not actually even uh, proposing that I think it is a realistic solution. But what I'm saying is that we are at the end with the Edmonton outs. This is this is whatever rock bottom is, they've blasted through it. They're in the magma of the earth. <laughs> they are literally, they are so awful. They got shut out by the same team twice. That can't happen. You they didn't get into the red zone. 20 minutes of football, you can't get one point in the CFL, and you, you come out in front of your home fans and don't get a single point? Like, it's just, it's mind-boggling. And the players look like absolutely just just dejected yeah. i feel awful for them i feel awful for taylor cornelius yeah. i'm so like i'm not actually i i've in the past I'm like well taylor cornelius we all just you know crucify 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 attack the quarterback always i'm not gonna do it man i just feel bad yeah. for the guy i think he's been put in an impossible situation that ultimately like is probably killing him mentally yeah He's probably got all his confidence gone. He clearly, physically, he's getting a hit on every play, well, practically. They've got nothing for an offensive lineman there. Which, but, like, we've known that for... I know. And, yeah. Yeah. And it's just... It's just like... I'm know. not saying that Demery here in Calgary is, like, the second coming of, I don't know, whoever the world's greatest <laughs> offensive lineman is. Um, <laughs> but he literally was... Orlando Brown? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but he was cut there. Yeah. Stayed in Edmonton for the entire year texted a Stampeders training staff to ask if he could come down and just show what he could do. Yeah. And like he was just there in Edmonton and then started a couple games for Calgary. Yeah. Ooh, Calgary has its problems. We spent most of this podcast talking about them. Can you tell him a annoyed about this? Yeah. It killed me watching that game last night. I was all I wanted to do was watch Fellowship of the Ring last night. Yeah. Because uh, I was hiking. So I was like, 
I'm watching Fellowship. And then I, but I was like, not until the CFL games are over. Yeah. And um, well, I, I could only stomach. To I had to watch the, that. I could only stomach to watch the first half. I got, I got to tell you, I had to turn it off. I just couldn't do it anymore. It's just too, it's, it's, it's sad. This is, this is the Edmonton football franchise name change regardless has been a storied history of winning and in the house that Hugh Campbell built Yes, and toughness, the house that Hugh Campbell and, and, and built. Well, here, and that's the funny thing. It's, and it's Rick it's, Campbell. It's, it's Rick Campbell in there going in there and setting this record. But I mean, Rick Campbell's paid to win football games and that's what he's doing. And I, it felt like that they weren't even, they weren't even trying to, they weren't trying to run up the score. Or they weren't trying to do anything. They were like, this is kind of embarrassing. And we're just going to like run this down. And you can tell they, the fact that they ran the ball 23 times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, we're just gonna run the ball. Yeah, that's how it's yeah. gonna go. It was embarrassing, and it it stinks, and it stinks for this league. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Like, the weird thing about it is, someone said to me today, like, oh yeah, you know, the fans are pissed, and I'm like the fans aren't pissed anymore, man. No, they've, they've the given fan, up. They just yeah, like, the fans they're, are they're defeated. The fans are apath apathetic. Yeah. Like the fans that's are. That's the last thing you want. Like, oh. you, you don't want apathy. I don't know how you come back have. from that as a organization. Like, how do you rebuild so, the trust with those fans who have said, well, we spent all this money and you put a terrible product that embarrasses me as an Edmontonian. I like, how do you rebuild that trust? I mean, say what you want about the Stampeders. And I know fans I'm, I'm avoiding opening tweet deck on her. Cause like, man, <laughs> are people going to be mad at me? The best part today, the, uh, today, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, you probably wouldn't have because you were, not I was, sitting I was, on your computer. No. I was like, I had water and was yes, literally doing this. Um, I but I at one point tweeted, like, on the second to last drive, a bunch of people just randomly wrote me about Drake. And I was, and I just wrote, like, not back to them, but I yeah. tweeted, I was like, it's like some of you only watch the quarterback. Like, move on, guys. It, and it then is, the next play, he threw an interception. And yes, I was like, uh, yeah, uh, my uh, time. Yeah. Uh, it is, it I, is hard to watch the whole field when you're, watching on television i can tell you that that's one of the things that i when i first started going to games in the stadium and covering games and it was like no no i can see the whole field maybe i should just like expand my peripheral vision and see the whole field and try to envision what the play is going on instead of you know you kind of when you fans go to the stadium sometimes they just watch what the quarterback is doing because that's what they see on tv and that's how they're conditioned to watch a football game whereas once you start to expand your your vision, you don't want to watch on TV anymore. I hate watching on television. I'd rather be in stadium, obviously. Can't do it all the time. Obviously, when they're in Montreal, you can't do it anymore. You used to do all 18 games, but I'm miserable about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us about it. Yeah. The the worst football team that I've ever covered was the four and 14 2004 Stampeders. They won four games. That's crazy to think about that literally they were starting the owner's son. That was 2003. Okay. But in 2004, they were starting just a new guy every week. Like I think four different guys started court at the quarterback. They started with Marcus Crandall and it was Tommy Jones and then a couple other people I can't remember. And then at the end of the year, it was Kahari Jones because they made a big trade to get Kahari Jones. That didn't pan out, obviously. But hmm. anyway, that is the worst football team that I've ever covered in terms of record. 2003 was also bad. They were 5-13. and 13. But like that is that team would kick the crap out of the Edmonton Elks right now. Huh? So because they had Denny Crahan as their defensive coordinator and he knew what he was doing on defense. Like, and again, I just so. it's always awkward when to be honest, like I, I always when the, with the Riders last year, stuff like that. But like this is my podcast now. You're my regular guest. You know, you're you're a part of this. We are two guys who live in Calgary. Yeah. So like. I swear on my life, like I'm taking no pleasure from this. Like this is oh. not a couple Calgary guys beating. I like, I want Victor Cui, like who I genuinely think has cool new ideas. I don't think all of them are going to work, no. but like but I, he's I, trying, he's, he's trying. trying and then he's being handed and, this and, and you can't sell a turd. Like you just can't. No. And, and Taylor Cornelius should have not been in that game the entire game. That no. That's the one I, thing where I'm willing to just come like, flat out and what, say it. At what point do you just give somebody else the chance what what do you got to lose at this point and i think we said this last week it was like well why isn't trey ford just doing something run a package for him like the guy can run like the wind Ian, like, i am not kidding you <laughs> if chris jones had just said midway through the qu third quarter like trey i want you to just run in and just show me how high you can throw the ball yeah just throw the ball as high as you can 
<laughs> I don't care what happens to it. You just just throw it really right. high. Like show me your arms. Like catch your own yeah, pass. Right in. Throw it up. Like, yeah. Remember. It would have been more productive than what it actually was happening out there. Like I and I'm not kidding. Yeah. Like it was that uh, bad. I'm thinking of Nelson when he's quarterbacking on the Simpsons, and he just he's like, "Oh, this is terrible." He throws the ball up, he runs past everybody, catches it in the end zone. Dude, that, that would be if Trey, like, Trey I, Ford could pull this off and be the Nelson of the uh, of the CFL. That would, be- as you know, I grew up in Toronto, went to a lot of Jays games as a kid. Yeah, I literally will never forget. I couldn't have been like older than ten. And third baseman Ed Spray. Oh yeah, hit a foul ball. The highest I've ever seen a foul ball. Yeah. And as a 10-year-old, I was just like, Woo! yeah. I mean, it, he was out. The yeah. ball came down. It was caught. But, yeah. like, but it, it was, was up there yeah. for a while. If, do that. Do that. Okay. Um, so okay. At, we, at one point in time, I, I was witness to – we used to have a giant speaker in the top of McMahon Stadium and it would hang over center field, right? It was way up there. Yeah. And we would always talk about, oh, can you hit it with a punt? And they're like, no, no, no. No, you can't. The only way to, would be to throw it straight up because that's your only – like your trajectory lane is going to be too high. So they, so they were just trying to like sit. Like this it was a competition with a former coach of the Stampeders who was a former quarterback. Who's like they're throwing it straight up at the speaker. He got within probably about ten feet. Matt Dunnigan was there. Okay, yeah, I was going to say because yeah. John Hoffnagel is also here, a former. So that coach. was the thing. Like we actually like somebody wrote the line, and I can't remember exactly who it was. Was like that's pretty sad when the best arm on your your team is your co- head coach. That was. That I couldn't write that. But it was like, yeah. And they kicked said, me out of stamps. Don't house. challenge Matt Dunnigan to try and hit the speaker because he will. And they actually, rumor was Michael Bishop. Stamps, I remember Michael CF, Bishop. Yeah. Fans from long ago will know he had a gun for an arm. There was a rumor that he hit one and hit it in practice. And nobody has ever been able to prove that. Interesting. Um, okay. I think we're. Note. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I honestly like, hey, tell me old stories about. Guys doing cool stuff. Oh uh, man, it was the uh, I got real I, I, heated about the Elks. Yeah, um, I, 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 I used to love watching Brad Sinopoli in practice. He would stand on the other thirty-five yard line, and they would ring it off the crossbar in the opposite end zone. It was unbelievable um, to watch. Um, you have thirty seconds to tell me why the BC Lions <laughs> against Winnipeg Blue Bombers is not the best game of the week in a week that involves the uh, Argos and Stampeders, Alouettes and Tie Cats. Red Lux Riders. No, there's no argument. I'm not actually going to make you do that. Of course, the best game of this week yeah, is the, BC at Winnipeg. Like, we're, um, we're looking at the, like, this is a West Final pre- preview, right? Like, yeah. Unless something drastic happens, this is our West Final, and you're going to feel like whatever that team is going to have, like, a, Winnipeg is going to come, is going to feel like they have something to prove right now. Yes. Um, when that's, it, that's at home for Winnipeg, too. Yeah. So, second time, like, that that's, bad taste is still going to be in the house. Oh, yeah. I mean, if the Lions go in and beat the Bombers at home, for that a second time, yeah, that after sends out the Elks for a second time. Like, that's like a ding dong, the witch is dead type yeah, of scenario. It's that's a, it's not and, really. And I don't well, actually. I like. Well, I have, like saying things that overstate how dumb the Bombers are, yeah, even though well, I don't believe just don't it. Promise to eat something if something happens. So because I know you always do that. I've done that once. Um, okay. <laughs> Anyways, to eat a hat or what? that's a great game. Toronto, Calgary, for obvious reasons we've discussed, I is think it has a lot of intrigue, and I wouldn't. Okay. Montreal, I'm not Ham- counting out the stands. Tonight. Montreal, Hamilton, ultimately, like, hey, hey, man, Montreal's back in it. Hamilton showed they're not dead yet. Um, there's now some. They, now they're going to have to like yeah. move forward with this other quarterback. And I don't like. I wouldn't. So. I wouldn't pick between. I, I wouldn't put the Riders above Ottawa. I'll tell you that. No. Nope. I wouldn't put Ottawa that much higher. But like that's just kind of a middle of the pack game between two yeah. teams that have lots of proof and are improving. I feel like all these games should be competitive. Yep. We didn't have. We had a couple of non-competitive games this weekend, and that's not. Fair. I think that people would argue at this point that the two and five Stampeders against the seven and zero Toronto Argonauts, we should not be saying will be competitive. I think I the Argos are seven. No, um, it's just so. honestly the Stampeders have made every game that they've been in competitive. They just can't win. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're yeah. all close. They're not. Have they been blown out? No. no. Like they've lost two games at home in overtime that went down to one play either way. That's what I'm saying. So it's uh, been a good time. You know what else is a good time? Fraser and Fig. <laughs> Fraser and Fig. <laughs> Fraser and Fig, man. What a sponsor. Honestly, thrilled to have them on board. Um, delicious, elevated cheese and charcuterie. Fresh artisanal provisions. Honestly, these guys are great. If you are looking for a charcuterie board or a charcuterie box, whatever you want, they got four sizes. Every occasion we've talked about it. 
We might. You talked about it so much. I'm just driving me nuts. I need to have some. We got to, we got to have some. Uh, <laughs> all their boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Their selections vary month to month, change all the time. Just because you've had one doesn't mean you've had them all. We love Fraser and Fig. I love Fraser and Fig. You haven't had Fraser and Fig yet. We are going to get well, you some Fraser and Fig. Now I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming here on times where they're not open. So. Like, yeah, and I haven't done a great job getting organized. That's the reality. <laughs> It's like I get this. The other time that I, I came up here on a scooter, so I was like, I, I'm not in any position to take a charter. Yeah, so I gotta, I gotta do it. I mean, again, it's available for pickup or delivery. So like, oh, there, okay. this is doable. Right. Um, and I'm gonna do it, and people should expect that of me. Um, you know. Anyways, this has been, oh, this has been a day. Um, it's yeah, been a, it was a wild day. game. I, as I said, if there is one thing that I will not back off on, and people sometimes are like, oh, look, I, I think with Jake, I'm not willing to throw, you know. No. To, to just say Jake's done, I think he's bad. I don't believe that. I think he's got some improving to do. I think he needs to do it. But he's a young quarterback. There's growing pains. I will say the Stamps are in trouble. That I'm not going to back off on. Yeah, that is uh, the... That and, is, and I was a bit more positive, I think, two weeks ago or a week ago. So you, we thought they were going to beat Ottawa. Now, yeah, I thought they were going to beat Ottawa. And <laughs> I thought they were going to beat Montreal. And maybe I just feel like they're just... And I always thought... plays away. Yeah, I... But that, that that's putting them a far way away. And I just knew I knew Montreal in Montreal is a tough game, and I, yes. so that's why I and thought you were, you, you, you were needed. Right. And it, like they had lost the last six visits to Montreal, and I didn't realize because I haven't been there in a long time. I just didn't realize it was that bad in the late two thousands and early twenty tens. They were pretty good in Montreal, so it uh, it's just now a six game losing streak in Montreal, and it's I, I don't this one you just chalk up to. Well, you don't want it to be a six-game losing streak in the regular season with these four games coming up. That oh. is it from – did you see how I segued there to this conclusion? Oh, my goodness. We should talk about Fraser and Fig more probably. <laughs> but um, I Honestly, we love them. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Fraser and Fig. Thank you, listeners. Uh, we'll be back later this week. Um, seriously, thank you for listening. Have a good one. Goodbye.